Hello all viewers and subscribers. This is going to be my in-depth review of the Sony A6300. This camera retails for around a thousand US dollars body only or around 1200 US dollars with the 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens. I've had this camera in my possession for a couple weeks now. I've been able to test it quite extensively out in the field shooting wildlife, action sports, landscapes, and a wide range of other things. So I'm gonna give you my thoughts on what I really, really enjoyed about shooting with this camera. Mention some issues I did have, some things to keep in mind if you are considering purchasing this camera, and hopefully help you decide whether this will be the right camera for you. So right off the bat, I am also gonna let you know, this review is gonna be focused on the video features of this camera. So if you're looking for a review that goes more into the stills, I won't be going quite as in depth into that. We'll be touching base certainly and giving you some samples of image quality, but overall this will be a video focused review. So keep that in mind and let's get started. So I'd just quickly like to run through some of this camera's biggest, most exciting features straight away. Of course, it does have to be said, this camera does shoot internal 4K at either 24 or 30 frames per second. Max resolution there would be 3840 by 2160. Not quite cinema 4K, unfortunately, but still very high resolution nevertheless. It's also able to capture up to 120 frames per second at 1080p, which gives you quite incredible slow motion video. When brought down to 24 frames per second, this equates to up to five times slow motion. They haven't forgotten about photographers, however, as the A6300 is also fitted with a 24 megapixel APS-C size sensor, which when paired with good glass gives you spectacular sharpness in your images, as well as great low light performance due to its fairly large sensor size. Also has a great burst rate of up to 11 frames per second when shooting stills and has what Sony is claiming to be the world's fastest autofocusing system with a mind blowing 425 AF points. And in my testing, I've been very impressed by the autofocusing capabilities of the 6300. I found I relied on it a lot more than I ever thought I would. It's actually quite capable even in video mode. On top of that, this camera also has support for S-Log2 as well as S-Log3, which when used gives you a maximum of 14 stops of dynamic range. And the icing on the cake would be that this camera is also weather sealed, something that a lot of manufacturers skip over, but thankfully Sony did not on this camera. But certainly enough blabbering on about specs, let's have a look at what this camera is actually capable of capturing. <music> So I hope you enjoyed that short video I put together showcasing some of the footage I was able to capture on the A6300. From here on out though, we will be going much more in depth into all the advanced features of this camera and there is a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. So let's start by having a look at the camera itself. Overall, it feels very well built, feels substantial in the hands. It is a smaller form factor camera, however, which can take a little getting used to, especially if you're used to using DSLRs as I am does still balance fairly well with larger lenses though, so it's not a huge issue once you get used to it. On the back of the camera, you can see it has a high resolution three inch LCD screen. It is partially articulating in the sense that you can tilt it both upwards 90 degrees, as well as downwards around 70 degrees. While this does give you a little more versatility when shooting either high or low angle shots, I'd much prefer a fully articulating screen myself, and not seeing that on this camera does feel like a bit of a step backwards in my opinion. With that said, the A7S II and A7R II also have the same problem, so I suppose it's more of a complaint I have for Sony than the camera itself. One thing Sony did do right, however, is with the viewfinder on the 6300. It's equipped with a high resolution OLED screen which gives you an incredibly sharp and crisp image. I found using the viewfinder was an absolute joy, especially compared to straining to see the LCD when in bright sunny conditions. Of course, this camera does come standard with a pop-up flash. Honestly, don't plan on using it very often myself as I typically only shoot with natural available light, but still it's definitely nice to have it built in and have it there if you ever need it. 
Thankfully, Sony did decide to also put a standard size hot shoe on the 6300, making using either external microphones, flashes, or other accessories much more painless. Moving on, on the left side of the camera, you'll find all of the available inputs. Starting at the top, we have a micro USB port for both charging, data transfer, as well as externally powering the camera. Just below that, we do have a micro HDMI port, which can be used for running video to either an external monitor, recorder, or a TV of some kind. It does support 4K through this HDMI out, so it is something to keep in mind. Also on the bottom, we do also have a microphone jack for using external microphones. Unfortunately, no headphone input for monitoring that audio, which is a bit disappointing, but personally, it's not a huge issue for me as I prefer to record external audio if I really want top-notch quality. Other than that, on the bottom of the camera, you can see we do have an SD card slot on the left and a battery compartment on the right. One small complaint I have with this is I'd much prefer that to see that SD card slot on the side of the camera for ease of access, but it's not a huge issue really, it's just something that you'll have to keep in mind. Another small complaint I have would have to be with the placement of the video record button. It's just too small and hard to press at times. Once you get used to it though, it's not a huge issue, it's more of just an annoyance overall. So to summarize, the build quality is great on the A6300, but could definitely use some minor tweaking as far as the ergonomics go. And from here, I'd also like to show you Sony's 18 to 105 f4 power zoom lens. This is the lens I decided to pick up with the A6300 for use as my primary zoom. This lens retails for around 600 US dollars. Overall, the build quality is very, very good on this lens. Feels solid and well built. While it is a larger lens, especially when compared to Sony's tiny 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens, it still balances quite well with the A6300 and didn't bother me at all when using it. Another thing to keep in mind is that the zooming is all internal in this lens. By that, I mean that when you zoom up to 105 millimeter, the lens's barrel does not extend past the body, which does help keep the size down a bit. I would probably classify this lens as a borderline all-in-one zoom. I say that because it has a quite large zoom range from quite wide at 18mm to medium telephoto at 105 But unlike a lot of other all-in-one zoom lenses, this lens maintains a constant f4 aperture for the entire zoom range. It's also image stabilized as you'd expect, giving you much less jerky videos and more capabilities to do stills at lower shutter speeds when zoomed in. I was quite impressed by the optical stabilization of this lens overall and didn't have many issues using this lens handheld, even at the telephoto end. Another unique feature of this lens is its powered electronic zooming. This allows you to more smoothly zoom when compared to a traditional lens. It does still have a proper zoom ring, however, if you prefer to use that instead of the power zoom knob. On top of that, this lens is also what is referred to as a pair focal lens, which basically means that it maintains its focus perfectly as you're zooming inwards and outwards, making it an overall great option for video work. It does have a few drawbacks, however, the biggest being a noticeable amount of pincushion distortion, especially at the telephoto end. Thankfully though, when shooting video, the A6300 does correct for this distortion, and in my testing, I didn't notice it much at all. It is something to keep in mind though, as it will likely show up when shooting raw images, which can still be corrected for fairly easily in post. Overall though, this lens is very sharp, has a lot of great features, especially if you shoot a lot of video, so this lens definitely gets a thumbs up from me. And while we're on the topic of lenses, I'd also like to briefly discuss adapting lenses for the A6300. I myself have a lot of Canon EF lenses, as I do own a T5i, which I am basically upgrading from. As you can see, I have a Sigma 30mm f1.4, Canon 50mm f1.8, as well as a Takina 11-16mm f2.8. But of course, Sony's E-mount format is incompatible with any Canon lenses out of the box, which means you need to buy an adapter of some kind. Still, because the A6300 does have an APS-C size sensor, you luckily don't require any kind of speed booster adapter to maintain your focal length, unless you are, of course, trying to adapt full frame lenses. You do however need to make sure you pick an adapter with automatic control unless you are using fully manual lenses, otherwise it's going to be a big issue. I myself ended up going with this Comlight EF2E mount adapter which cost me around $130. It gives you control of the aperture, allows you to autofocus, as well as use image stabilized lenses. In my experience though, the autofocus was pretty much useless with this adapter, meaning you have to manually focus more often than not. You also need to make sure that your lenses are compatible with this adapter, as not all EF or EFS lenses will work. 
All my lenses work no problem, however, and still some which aren't listed may still work as my Takina 11-16 worked perfectly and is not listed as being compatible on their website. But despite the drawbacks, certainly being able to even use these lenses on this camera is amazing and opens up a wide range of possibilities. Now moving back to the camera itself, I'd like to go much more in depth into the advanced video features of the 6300. So let's start by talking 4K. In terms of the 4K capabilities of this camera, it's able to capture at either 24 or 30 frames per second. One interesting thing is that when you're shooting at 24p, this camera will actually give you a full pixel readout as well as no pixel binning, which basically means that this camera will be taking a 6K image from the sensor downsampling it to 4K as it's being captured and what this does is it maintains the focal length of your lens without cropping in and also gives you better sharpness as well as very little moray or artifacting in your footage. And my testing I certainly found that. Unfortunately when you're shooting at 30p however it will crop in to roughly two times and not make use of this feature. Still I much prefer the aesthetic of 24p anyways so I'll be shooting at that in most situations. In practice, I was completely blown away with the quality of the 4K image out of this camera. Sharpness is spectacular when using good glass and will not disappoint in that regard. One thing to keep in mind, however, is this camera does have noticeable rolling shutter issues. And if you're doing quick, fast pans, it will show up in your footage. Uh, it also seemed a little bit more pronounced in the 4K mode as well, likely because of all the processing this camera is doing behind the scenes. Still, most consumer cameras on the market today do also have issues with rolling shutter. So it's not really a, uh, an issue unique to this camera. It's something that you should definitely keep in mind though and adjust your shooting style for if you decide to pick up this camera, but it shouldn't really be a deal breaker in my personal opinion. So as I said before, the Sony H6300 does also shoot super slow motion video at 1080p. The max frame rate this camera can capture would be 120 frames per second. This one brought down to 24p relates to five times slow motion or four times slow motion if you're bringing it down to 30p instead. Of course, this gives you a lot more versatility when shooting action scenes or anything of fast motion really. It's also just plain fun to shoot and experiment with. So let's have a quick look at some of the slow motion videos I was able to capture on the 6300. So as you can see, this camera does a great job shooting slow motion video. Sharpness is still great for 1080p, and while I haven't had quite enough time to test it against the 1080p video at 24p, I'm sure it's nearly identical. Another really nice feature in shooting slow motion is that this camera can actually interpolate the footage down to 24 or 30 frames per second internally, which will give you an instant preview of your slow motion video right after shooting it. Unfortunately, it doesn't record audio when you're using this feature, you can still record audio at 120 frames per second if you turn this feature off. So you'll have to make the call on what you prefer in any given situation. So to summarize, the slow motion is quite amazing on this camera and I definitely say Sony is pushing the envelope in this price point. Now let's get into the dynamic range of the 6300. This camera does come included with both S-Log2 as well as S-Log3 picture profiles 
which Sony claims to give you a maximum of 14 stops of dynamic range. And certainly after using this camera for some time, I really do believe it. It's one of the first things that actually blew me away initially when I first started using this camera, which is how much more dynamic range I had access to. Footage out of the camera when properly exposed is super flat and maintains a ton of detail in both the shadows as well as the highlights. After contrast adjustment and color correction, uh, I was able to produce very aesthetically pleasing images in pretty much all situations. I also get great colors and still maintain a lot of detail. Now one thing I want to mention is my experience between the difference between S-Log2 and S-Log3. I found that while S-Log3 does give you a tiny bit more dynamic range, the compromise is that it actually produces uh, slightly noisier images, although in areas of the image which aren't accessible to S-Log2. But I found the noise undesirable in most cases and when crush the blacks in those areas, removing that detail anyways. For myself, and I'd say most people, I would say S-Log2 does have the better workflow while still giving you very high dynamic range. Another great feature built into this camera is called Gamma Display Assist. Now when shooting S-Log, your videos will be very flat and as a result, really hard to monitor on screen. This feature solves that problem by increasing the contrast on your monitor, giving you a much better preview of what your final image is gonna look like. One annoyance when shooting S-Log, however, is uh, the fact that you are locked to a minimum of 800 ISO. This makes shooting in bright, sunny conditions a bit more of a challenge in some situations as you will need to either crank up your shutter speed or aperture more than you might want to, or uh, alternatively have ND filters ready to properly expose your images. So I'm not sure why the, this is. I'm sure there's a technical reason, but just thought I would mention it. So moving on, I'd like to touch on the low light capabilities of this camera. With its fairly large APS-C size sensor, it is able to gather quite a lot of light, giving you great results in darker environments, especially when paired with fast glass at or under f2.8. Of course, it isn't quite as capable as Sony's A7S Mark II or A7R Mark II as those are full-frame cameras, but it's surprisingly comparable to them considering it is a third of the price. To demonstrate this, I ran a quick test of the high ISO performance of the 6300 in a pretty extreme circumstance. This was shot with my Sigma 30mm f1.4 shot wide open. As you can see, the only light source in this shot is just a single lighter. Cropping in here reveals that you do start to see quite a lot of noise at 12800 ISO and significantly more noise at 25600 ISO. Still very clean at 6400 ISO however, and obviously below that is even cleaner. I'd say it's usable up to 12800 ISO really if you're in a pinch. You have to keep in mind, uh, I did crop in quite far in that demonstration, so normally you won't see nearly that much noise. And here you can see a much more realistic low light test. This was shot just after the sun had set at 6400 ISO using my 18-105 to f4 lens. As you can see, it's quite underexposed and unusable out of the camera, but I was able to pull a surprising amount of detail back as you can see here. So if you haven't already realized, Sony is really pushing the video features on the 6300. And I was very impressed to see a ton of smaller features which can greatly assist in shooting high quality video included as well. For one, peaking, which helps a lot with manually focusing, as well as zebras, which shows you your overexposed areas of your images included and they are heavily customizable. I ended up settling on using peaking at sort of its middle setting in most situations with red outlines. And Zebra's at 100% so as to not distract me while shooting, but uh, just warn me if I'm overexposing my image too much. On top of that, marker displays are able to be turned on, giving you a preview of alternate aspect ratios or a bunch of other framing guidelines as well. I did notice that the aspect ratio seemed to be listed incorrectly, however, as the 2.35 to 1 mode is way too wide, and it seems that what's listed at 1.85 to 1 is actually the CinemaScope guideline. So I'm not sure how Sony could have messed that up, but I'm sure they'll fix it in firmware. Another interesting less talked about feature is what Sony calls clear image zoom. This feature basically extends the zoom range of your zoom lens by cropping in on the sensor until it begins to degrade the image quality significantly. Now, while well, similar to digital zoom, you have to keep in mind that the A6300 does have a 24 megapixel sensor and 4K video is only around 8 megapixels, so um, really you can crop in quite far without losing much detail and much sharpness. Of course, it does degrade the image quality, so I wouldn't really rely on it, especially in low light situations, you will see uh, definitely more noise. But if you're in a pinch, I'd certainly take advantage of it and I myself plan to leave it on so it's there if I ever need it. 
One really nice small touch is that when you're using continuous autofocus when shooting video, peaking will actually hide itself until you begin manually focusing. Speaking of which, I was blown away by how well the continuous autofocus maintains focus when using general lenses. I ended up leaving it on much more than I ever thought I would. You can actually switch to manual focus at any time by uh, simply pushing a button on the back of the camera. So that was great to see kind of a workflow integrated where you have a kind of a hybrid between continuous autofocus and manually focusing at any time. Now another really nice feature I haven't heard many people talking about is the inclusion of dual video recording. Now what this does is basically record a 720p video simultaneously to either your 4K video or 1080p video. Now if you're wondering what would be the possible advantage of recording a 720p video when you have a much higher quality 1080 or 4K video, well the answer to that would be uh, processing time. Uh, the amount of time it takes to edit together a 4K uh, video is significantly higher than a simple 720p one. So that feature's there if you um, ever want to get your content out there really quick. You just want kind of a rough copy of it to upload to the web quickly and easily. Editing 720p video is quick and easy, so um, it definitely does assist very much with that. And of course, you can go back afterwards and uh, go back to that 4K video you still have and get a much more professional version out uh, eventually. So that's just about all the video features I wanted to cover in this review. So let's move on and briefly touch on the photography features of this camera. So as I said before, the A6300 does have a 24 megapixel sensor, which one paired with good glass gives you exceptional sharpness for capturing stills. It does also shoot RAW as well as JPEGs. Uh, and you are able to lower your resolution when shooting JPEGs, but you are locked to 24 megapixel when shooting RAW. Sony does also include free software called Capture One, which can be used for processing and editing your RAW images, but of course you can use Lightroom if you prefer. This camera does also have a very impressive burst rate of up to 11 frames per second when shooting in continuous drive mode, or alternatively you can shoot up to 8 frames per second and have no delay uh, of your, what you're seeing versus capturing, whereas in the 11 frames per second mode there will be a delay. They've also included a fully silent shutterless mode, which unfortunately in my testing I found lowered the dynamic range too much to actually be usable. But uh, to be honest, I haven't had too much time to test this super extensively, so it's possible I was doing something wrong, but felt it was still worth mentioning. One really frustrating decision Sony made was to not include time-lapse functionality in the camera and instead charge $10 for it and require a very tedious process to get a, basically a time-lapse app installed on the camera. Um, from what I've heard, it's, it's the same for a lot of Sony's other cameras, including the A7S Mark II and A7R Mark II, and those are $3,000 cameras, so it's a bit insulting for Sony to charge for that kind of basic functionality. Um, it's not so much uh, the cost, but you know the, the process of installing it is, is quite annoying and takes quite a long amount of time. I will be uploading an actual guide on how to do it as I did have some issues myself and hopefully help, that will help prevent some headaches there. So that's just about everything I wanted to cover on the still side of things. So let's move on and uh, let's discuss some of the issues and problems I did have shooting with this camera. Of course, no camera is perfect and despite the 6300's amazing feature set, it is no exception. So the biggest issue overall with this camera would definitely be with battery life. Unfortunately, Sony uses the same small 1000 milliamp battery that they do in the majority of their other cameras, and it really just isn't cutting it. I found that when using the camera, I'd get somewhere between an hour and a half to just over two hours of battery life when shooting continuously. There are some workarounds to this, thankfully, mainly the fact that you are able to power the 6300 uh, with external power, either AC power or also an external USB power bank. I decided to do the latter and pick up this only $30 Anchor USB power bank. Uh, it's 10,000 milliamps, it gives you significantly more battery, like roughly 10 times what the internal battery can hold, so it makes a pretty big difference. Uh, my temporary solution was just to put the battery in my pocket and uh, plug it in with a six foot USB cable. Obviously not the most elegant solution, but it does make quite a difference for how long you're able to use the camera at a given time. So the battery life is definitely something to keep in mind. You'll either need to go the route I went or also pick up a couple spare batteries with this camera. Also, as I mentioned previously, rolling shutter is noticeable on this camera. You will notice it if you're doing quick, fast pans and it can be quite undesirable in your videos. Overall though, I find if you adjust your shooting style so as to not bring too much attention to it, it is fairly easy to keep it from being noticeable in your footage. Also, I do have some complaints as far as form factor goes. For one, I'd love to see that SD card slot move to the side of the camera rather than uh, right next to the battery compartment. 
I also really wish the screen was fully articulating uh, and also the record button could be in a much better location as it is a little hard to push. It's also a bit disappointing to not see a headphone jack included, but uh, certainly not the end of the world. But other than that, those are really my only big complaints with this camera and from there it will bring us to the conclusion of this review. Is this camera worth the cost? The short answer would be a resounding yes. If you're using it for video or wanting to get a professional level camera that does it all and you're looking at this price range, I'd definitely say pick it up. It's incredible value for money, outperforms basically all its competition, especially as far as video quality goes. I mean, it's really a game changer to see such an amazing camera at this price. The long answer would be yes, however, it depends how you're planning on using this camera. If you're planning on using the camera primarily for stills and don't shoot a lot of video, it's a much tougher decision. There's a ton of other cameras that also have 24 megapixel sensors and give very similar results to the 6300 while being quite a bit cheaper. Um, also on top of that, there are some cameras across around the same and give you uh, actually better results for stills. Uh, one example of this would be Sony's original A7, which is still on the market, has a 24 megapixel full frame sensor, and like I said, costs around the same as this camera. But certainly, it doesn't mean this camera isn't worth it. You just have to keep in mind you are paying extra for all the amazing video features on this 6300. So if you don't plan on using them, there are definitely some better options out there in my opinion. But if you're looking for a camera that does it all, takes great stills, has incredible video quality and features, and you're looking in this price point, I'd seriously consider the A6300. So thanks for watching this review. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you're so inclined. I will be uploading a 4K sample of what the footage actually looks like in 4K, as this review will all be 1080p downsampled. So uh, keep, keep an eye out, there will be a lot more content coming out to this channel.